Hey, let's just uh, uh, pray really quickly. I just want to pray, and then I just want to continue on uh, what we've been talking about, this journey of faith. So, Father, I just pray right now, Lord, would you just open our ears to hear something new this morning? Open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to each uh, individual. Lord, let them hear what you're saying today in a language that they understand. Father, hear something, see something today that when we get up and we leave this place this morning, Father, we are more uh, in love with Jesus. Our faith has been deepened. Our understanding has been expanded. And that, Lord, this week when we go out there and we go back to work and to school and everything, we do it with a, a bit more of a rod of iron in our backbone that we are followers of Jesus or we're moving towards that place and that we, uh, God, we won't be swayed and pushed around by every wind of doctrine, by every thought and impression and philosophy of life, but we're going to stand for Jesus. So, Father, I just pray that this morning over each person here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me get my glasses on. NASA engineers built a cannon that launches dead chickens at the windshields of airplanes. Yep, that's true. I'll say it again. NASA engineers built a cannon that launches dead chickens at the windshields of airplanes, military jets and such to test the strength of the windshields against collision with airborne fowl. British engineers are eager to test it on the windshields of their new high-speed trains, so arrangements are made and a cannon is sent to the British engineers. When the cannon goes off, the engineers stand shocked as the chicken crashes into the shatterproof shield, smashes it into smithereens, blasts through the control console, snaps the pilot's backrest into and embeds itself in the back wall of the cabin. The horrified Brits send the Americans a report of the disastrous results along with an urgent request for suggestions on improving the windshield design. And the American engineers respond with a one-line memo, Thor the chicken. Thor the chicken. Sometimes the answers to the questions we have are very simple. And I want to just say that what we've been talking about here with faith is nothing overly profound. So we began a journey about four or five weeks ago about faith, and we've talked about the fact that faith is important to the Christian life. Is everybody aware of that? It doesn't matter whether you like it or whether you understand it or whether you get it. To be brutally honest, I hate it. But I can't avoid the fact that Jesus made it very clear that faith is something that's very important to the Christian life. And faith has the capacity to allow God the space to do what he wants. And somehow a lack of this thing called faith has the capacity to slow down or hinder or stop God doing what he wants. I hate that. I don't like it. But it doesn't matter. It's in these ancient documents, so that settles it for me. So we've talked about that. We've looked at the fact that everyone actually has faith. You might be a person in here right now who says, whoa, 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 I'm not a Christian. I didn't say you're a Christian. What I said is you have faith. We all exercise faith every day of our lives, and we always have. We, we, we exercise faith when we got out of bed this morning and we jumped in the car. We put faith in the petrol in the car that it would get us there. We put faith that the other drivers on the road wouldn't smash into us. You came in here, you sat on that chair, you put faith in the fact that that chair could carry your body weight, wouldn't collapse under you. You made your coffee this morning, you put milk in it by faith, trusting that the milk company had done their job. You weren't there. You don't know if they weren't trying to poison you, but you just put that milk in by faith. You put the coffee in, the sugar in by faith. Every single person lives by faith. Faith is not unique to religion. Faith is the way that we all live. The difference is where we place our faith at different points in our life. We've looked at the foundation of the Christian faith, and the foundation of the Christian faith is the character and nature of God. God's ways may change. His outcomes may change. What he did yesterday, he may do different tomorrow. That person got healed. That person didn't. That person got that financial thing they prayed for. For some reason, this person had to work for five years, save the money to get the car they wanted. Why does that happen? I have no answers. There's a mystery aspect to God. And we don't put our faith in the outcomes of God. We don't put our faith in what God does because that changes from time to time. We put our faith in who God is because his character and his nature never changes. Amen? Put our faith in that. And then last week we had a fantastic message on looking at some of the ways to examine whether you actually have that foundation of faith in place in your life. Now, if you've missed any of those, you can go on to, we've got the YouTube channel there, you can go on there and you can catch up with where we're at. I want to take it another step further today. And today I want to look at the fruit, the true fruit of biblical faith. What's the fruit of biblical faith? In Luke chapter 17, now before I do, Luke, can you put my, my first slide up there too, by the way? Anyone know what that is? Hey? Good, think about it. We'll get there eventually. Next one, please, Luke. Luke 17. 
verse 3 to 5, Jesus said this. He said, so watch yourselves. He says, if your brother or sister sins against you, anyone have a brother or sister sin against them? Anyone? Two of us. Oh, that's your sister right next to you. Put your hand down, son. He's not meaning literal brother and sister, but I know where you're coming from. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Who's ever been sinned against and ever had to forgive someone? Anybody? Who thinks sometimes forgiveness is difficult? Now, if you go back and you look at Jewish teaching and Jewish tradition, Jewish tradition uh, 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 ascribed to the fact that if somebody sinned against you three times, the same sin three times in a day, you forgave them three times. That's kind of what you did. Three times. So there is kind of a limit there in the Jewish tradition to forgiveness. But Jesus comes here and he says, if someone sins against you, he says, if they sin against you seven times in a day. Now, later on in the book of Matthew, Jesus is going to take that even further and he's in, in the book of Matthew, and he's going to say this phrase 70 times 7. You ever heard of that? Someone sins against you 70 times 7, right? That's a lot of forgiveness in a day. If somebody does the wrong, I'm just letting you know, if you do the wrong thing by me 70 times 7 in one day, I don't want to see you tomorrow. Stay away from me. I don't want to be near you. If you're going to cause me that much pain and grief. But Jesus says, hey, here's the point. Somebody does something against you, here's what a believer does. Here's what a follower of Jesus does, is they learn to forgive. Now, now the, the Jewish concept of forgiveness did not mean that if I forgive you, that, that forgiveness from me meant that there was no consequence for you. There are consequences. It's a bit like your child does something wrong, and you catch them, and you ground them. And then after a couple of hours in their bedroom, they come out, and they say, Mom, Dad, I'm really, really sorry. And you go, you know what? I really forgive you. But back to your room. Because the consequence doesn't disappear. So, so the, the Jewish concept of forgiveness does not devoid consequence. The Jewish concept of forgiveness is really about the forgiver, right? It's about the, the person. And the Jewish concept of forgiveness is this, that you've sinned against me 70 times 7. Come and ask forgiveness. I forgive you. And what I'm saying in forgiving you is this. You have hurt me. You have done wrong. What you have done uh, has not been good. It hasn't been a blessing. But I'm going to, to forgive you and let you to know that relationship continue on. It was about a continuation of relationship. So, so understand what Jesus is saying here. This is difficult, right? This is difficult stuff. These disciples have been with Jesus for a long time and they've seen a lot of things. Up to this point in, in the book of Luke alone, right up to Luke 17, here's what they've seen. They've seen healings. They've seen Jesus heal people physically of sicknesses and diseases. They've seen him deliver people of demonic spirits and demonic oppression, cast demons out. They've seen him restore paralytics, guys that were paralyzed, lying and, and weren't able to walk. They've seen with their own eyes Jesus lay hands on them and these paralytics get up. They've actually seen Jesus raise people from the dead. They've seen Jesus physically and literally calm a storm. Who would love to step outside right now, exercise your faith and calm this storm so we can get on with our life and play sport this week? Anyone else? Just me. Amen. Two people. Thanks, Sarah. They've seen him do it. They've seen him multiply food, take a couple of Mars bars and a cherry ripe and snap it and bang, everybody's having fondue fountains. Trying to think of a modern day analogy. Bread and fish, you'd be like, well, I don't eat bread. I don't like fish. <sighs> He's had a conversation with Moses and Elijah. He went up on a mountain. He was transfigured on a mountain. And he actually had a conversation with Moses and Elijah. And some of the disciples actually saw that. But at none of these junctures at all, is it anywhere recorded in any of these documents that at those points they said, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. We've just seen a healing and a miracle. We would love to do that, Lord, increase our faith. God, we've just seen you cast a demon out. Wow, that's awesome. Jesus, increase our faith so we can do that. Wow, you've broken bread. Wouldn't that be awesome? I could cut our food budget in half, Jesus. Give me the faith to go home to my wife and I'll say to my wife, 200 bucks for shopping. Give me the 200. I'll just pray a private blessing. Come home with more than enough food and pocket the rest of the money. She'll never know. 
But at none of these points did the disciples feel the urge or the need to request Jesus in the midst of that and go, okay, we need more faith to be involved in something like that. We need more faith to do that. Yet here we have Jesus talking about forgiving somebody else. He's talking about uh, somebody does you wrong. And what's the response that comes from the disciples? It says, the apostles turned, they said to him, increase our faith. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that they could see all these miracles and yet nowhere is it recorded that they had the urge to go, we want more faith because we need more faith to do. As a matter of fact, the very next verse, without going there, if you continue on, Jesus ends up saying, look, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this tree, be uprooted and go. In other words, faith for the miracle. But faith to live the Christian life every day, that's another story. Yeah, faith like a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain. Faith for miracles. What we need is faith to live the Christian life every day. What we need is faith to treat other people the way that Jesus wants us to treat them. We need faith to make decisions at work the way that Jesus would make decisions. We need faith to go to school and to treat people the way that Jesus would treat them in that environment. We need faith just to live the Christian life every day. Amen? Those who are justified will live by faith, Paul writes. And the greatest fruit of faith is a transformed life. The evidence of faith in my life is not how many sick people have I healed. The true biblical evidence of faith in my life is not how many demons have I cast out of somebody. The the true evidence of biblical faith in my life is not how many spiritual gifts have you seen me exercise. It's funny... I had a guy come into the church here a few years ago, a lovely gentleman. He sat through two services and he came up to me at the end of the second one and he said, can I talk to you, him and his wife? He said, are you, are you Pentecostal? I said, yeah, we are. We're actually a Pentecostal church, you know. He said, well, well, I'm struggling because I don't see people just breaking out in tongues and I don't see all... I said, well, you're probably not going to see that either, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't see in here that that's such a big deal. I was chatting with a gentleman this week. He came on in and he was doing the sound stuff with the new road going through and um, he was in for a bit of a chat and before you know it, he's telling his wife goes to a a Pentecostal church up the Gold Coast there and uh, we're having a bit of a chat and I could tell that he was a bit resistant to the whole thing and I thought, I asked him the question, is it, is it, are you a bit resistant and hesitant to all this stuff because of the concept and idea of God or is it because of some of the Pentecostal carry-on that maybe you've seen? And I picked up it was a little bit of both. But the evidence of faith is not all that stuff. The true biblical evidence of faith is a transformed life and a person that lives the Christian life every minute of every day. Living it at work, living it out at school, living it out in the home. Husbands to wives, wives to husbands, parents to children, children back to parents. Employees to the employer. The employer down to the employee co-worker to co-worker. It's the way that we live our life in line with the values and the ethics of the kingdom of God and the teachings of Jesus. That's the true biblical fruit of faith. And that's what the disciples realised. Jesus starts talking about how they should live their life, the practical day-to-day, everyday stuff of life. That's when they went, wow, we really need faith to live that. If if we're going to do that, we we, we need faith. I mean, I I can kind of fake faith with a bit of Tongues, yeah, ba dabba 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 dabba. You don't know. I could come up and give you a, a word and maybe it was from God, maybe it's not, maybe it's right, maybe I've looked it, I don't know. Maybe I'm just trying to impress people. Maybe it's genuine, I don't know. I don't know. I can get up here and preach. And you could look and go, gee, that man loves Jesus. Well, maybe I don't. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm just really, really good and charismatic and can hold an audience and stand in front of people and talk for a long time. Too long, I heard some people say. We don't know. But when I step down from here and you examine my life, that's when you'll really be able to tell whether the fruit, whether I have faith. Because the fruit of genuine faith is the way I live my life as a believer. Not the performance part, not the things I do. It's the way I live my life in the everyday mundane moments of life. How do I handle the pressure at home when the finances aren't there? You know? How do I handle it when the kids are pushing my patience? And now I'm not talking about perfection. 
But the point I'm making here is that the, the, the fruit of genuine Christian biblical faith is first a transformed life, not all the performance issues that we tend to focus on more so than that. Now, some people find obedience to Jesus' teachings a lot easier than others. Who would agree with that? There are certain personalities that... Anyone ever read, uh, you know, you think about the fruit of patience. And how many of you know there are some people that just seem naturally more patient than others? Anyone observe that? Anybody the other end of the spectrum? You're just naturally probably not as patient as other people. Anybody like that? Bevan, you're hugging your wife. Are you comforting her or are you apologising? Okay, great. She was nudging him in the ribs. Some people find it easier to live certain ethics and values of kingdom because of personality type, maybe because of the way you're brought up. Your morals and values lined with biblical values a lot easier, so you're not drawn into a bunch of other things and so on. So there's lots of different things where we could just go, but it's easy for that person that. I remember hearing a story by Rick Joyner many years ago, and Rick Joyner was talking about uh, some friends of his that he was counselling that had a, uh, some marital issues going on. A- a- and he made this statement. He said, when I sat down with that gentleman and I counseled him in his marriage, he, he, his, they hadn't divorced, the marriage was together. But he said, the reality is this, because of the makeup of personalities, backgrounds, up stuff, he said, I, being Rick Joyner, he said, I have to do less in obedience to the commands of Jesus to make my marriage work than that gentleman does. He has to do a lot more in obedience to the, to the word of God to make his marriage work than I do because... The attitude and the environment in my marriage is much more easier to, to walk with Christ than it is over there. Maybe he has to extend much more grace to his wife. Maybe Rick Joyner felt like his wife was just that perfect. He didn't have to extend any grace. I relate to that. Just thought I'd use that moment. All you husbands out there, use every moment you can. So in order to get around this kind of Jesus throws in this ridiculous number. He says 70 times 7. In other words, you might be the most patient and gracious human in the world. But I'm telling you, 70 times 7 in a day, you're going to lose that gracious, nice temperament. That's going to push any human being to the point so that you all understand, forget about it's easy for them. No, no, at some point, all of us, all of us are going to be challenged to make the decision and the choice to do things Jesus' way or to keep doing things another way. See, living the Christian life takes more faith than participating in a miracle. Because the true fruit of biblical faith is a transformed life, not the achievement of some desired outcome. Let me say that again. Living the Christian life takes more faith than participating in a miracle. Because the true fruit of biblical faith is a transformed life, not the achievement of some desired outcome. So often in Western church and Pentecostalism, we've reduced faith to something we step into to get some kind of an outcome. I need healing. So I need to generate enough faith to believe God for a miracle and for healing. I need financial break. So I need to, I'm going to get into the word of God in a flurry. I mean, I never read it otherwise, but I know I need faith now. So I'm going to get into it. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm going to get into the word of God, study every scripture I can on financial blessing and prosperity to build my faith bucket up so that maybe without, I wouldn't say this, but possibly potentially I can spiritually manipulate God into pouring the buckets out and giving me what I want. Once I've got it, I probably won't pick this book up for another year till I need the next round. And some people, I'm not pointing fingers, but some people, and you you probably know people like that, have reduced faith to just something we try to get into our world to get a perceived outcome or something that we want from God. And we miss the point of faith. Faith is not in and out of in order to, to, to fill the bucket to get that from God or get through that moment or that difficulty. Faith is a way of life. Faith is the way we live our life 24-7. In fact, without going too deeply into it, Fruit and repentance in the New Testament are linked in the same way that faith and repentance are linked. You ever notice that? Uh, uh, just a couple of quick examples. Matthew 3, 8, Jesus said this. He said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Speaking to those that claim to know God, he said, well, bear fruit. If you're truly repented, there's fruit. In other words, black and white. If you've really repented, you're going to look different. That's what he's saying. In, in Mark 1, 15, Jesus said this. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. So if you go back to the writings of the Gospels, you'll see that faith and repentance are linked. So is fruit and repentance linked. They're almost interchangeable at times, faith and fruit. So if we're truly repentant 
and we've truly placed faith in him, then there'll truly be some semblance of fruit. And, and before we go thinking, but the fruit is the miracles, the signs, the wonders and all that stuff, Jesus debunks that very, very quickly. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 24, Jesus says this. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who what? Does the will of my Father who's in heaven. I know we don't like this kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, 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 we live in a generation of world right now that wants to just have the best of the world and we'll tack a bit of faith onto the side of it. But I often wonder, maybe that is reflective in the amount of power and authority as a body and the amount of evidence that we take to the world about the reality of God because one other thing I can't escape right from the Bible is that, that, that God... And Jesus consistently said, if you, if you follow me, if you do what I'm saying, I'll bless you. If you do things my way, I'll bless you. Now, don't interpret blessing to mean five houses and ten cars. But he said, I will bless you. When you live in obedience to me, there will be blessing for that. And if you live outside of that, well, you could probably end up with perceived blessing. I mean, let's face it. There are lots of rich people who got rich doing the wrong thing. They got lots more money than you and me. They've got houses and cars and Cadillacs and boats and jets and all kinds of things. But I wonder whether they've got peace in their heart. I don't know. The greatest blessing any human being can have is peace. Peace in the midst of a chaotic world. Peace in the midst of a chaotic mind, a chaotic heart. To have peace in our world, that blessing of peace. Peace I leave with you, peace I give you. And Jesus said, not like the world gives, because my peace isn't stapled to whatever the thing is that you think gave you peace. You can have that thing. Get the car, you got peace. You lose the job, the peace disappears with it. You get the pretty girl, you got peace. You lose the pretty girl, the peace goes with it. That's the peace of the world. It's stapled to whatever the object is. Jesus says, I'll give you peace regardless. You can get that job, you can lose that job, you can still have peace. Why? Because the kind of peace I give you isn't attached to the external things. It goes much deeper than that. It's peace in knowing I love you and knowing that we're reconnected. It's peace in knowing that when we get through this journey, there's going to be a massive party thrown. You're going to be there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be wonderful. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name we drove out demons. In your name we performed many miracles. In other words, we did all the faith stuff, God. Come on, we did it all. We were smack bang in the middle of it. And I'll tell them plainly, I didn't know you. We didn't have relationship. We didn't have relationship. See, faith, f- faith flows out of relationship with God and that transforms our world and transforms our life. First, all the other stuff is secondary. In, in Pentecostal circles along the line over the years, we're probably more balanced now, but we flipped the script. Didn't, we made it all about the miracles, the signs and wonders. Everybody would turn up on a Sunday, so he was going to fall over. The prophet comes to town. Everybody just leaves their local faith community. We'll follow the prophet from town to town because we want a word. We want all these things. And we missed it. It's not about that. When I wake up tomorrow morning before I put my feet on the ground, Lord, increase my faith. I need faith to go out there in the world tomorrow and to operate as a fully-fledged believer in Jesus. I need faith to stand my ground when culture's pushing against me. I need faith to stand my ground when, when, when... Everything coming at me is backing me into a corner and saying, obey me or else. I need to have the faith to go, I'll take the or else, thank you. Even if it costs me. Even if it costs me. See, this kind of faith that Jesus talks about had nothing to do with miracles or spiritual gifts. In fact, Matthew 25, when you've got some time there, go there yourself, the sheep and the goats passage. Remember that one? It says that when the Son of Man comes at the end and he's going to separate all the people, like the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats, and he'll say to his people, he'll say, blessed are you, enter into your rest. Because I, was, I, I, was, I had a broken leg and you prayed for me and healed me. Because I had a demon and you had authority and cast it out of me. I didn't say any of that. As I was naked, you clothed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. Had no clothes, my back. You met my need. And they're so amazed at this. They say, When do we do that? When do we do any of that? See, they've been so transformed, their lives. 
their hearts that they didn't even notice that that was out of the ordinary. That's just what you do. God, you love everybody. We're all in your, made in your image. We've all got that little fingerprint, your DNA on us. God, this is what we do as believers. Those that follow Jesus, this is what we do. They're amazed. Then he turns to the others and he goes, you didn't do any of that. And they're the ones like here in Matthew 7. Yeah, but we cast out demons though. We healed the sick. We raised the dead. We did all the stuff. He goes, you missed the point. You missed the point. The true fruit of biblical faith is a transformed life. It's how we live our life. It's not all the power plays and all the bells and whistles and all the big stuff. It's the everyday existence. How do I treat my wife? Do I treat my wife a way that Jesus would be pleased with? Does she treat me Jesus would be pleased with? Do I treat my friends in a way that Jesus would be pleased with? Not sitting back going, but they don't treat me that way. That's not what faith says. I'll treat these people that way and I'll leave the rest with you, God, because that's faith. Because I trust you. I'm not a doormat. Don't read, interpret that as I'm saying be a doormat. I'm not. We still use wisdom. But the point is we live our life every day. We take our cues from Jesus. So how do we develop this kind of faith? Faith that transforms your life, not just gets an outcome for you. Let me just finish real quick with this. John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. Here's what Jesus said. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Who's he speaking to? Just just said said it right there. Who's he speaking to? No, we haven't got it up there. To the Jews who believed in him. Right? Have we got a slide there? No, it's all good. It says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said to them, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He's speaking to a bunch of people that believed in him, right? Now, fast forward to verse 59, the end of the very same chapter. Those same people are picking up stones to stone him. Isn't that amazing? These Jews that believed in him, he begins to teach them. By the end of the conversation, it says they've got stones in their hand, and they literally want to kill him. But see, he makes a key statement. He says, if you hold to my teaching, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. So apparently we're not all free necessarily just because we believe in it. I've got my faith in Jesus, but the journey continues from that point. Amen? The journey continues. I've got to hold to the teachings of Jesus. That word hold literally means to remain, to dwell, to continue, to journey with and to continue to be present in, to stay in the teachings of Jesus. Now, here's the reality. At some point, as we continue in the teachings of Jesus, we will come across things that we just don't like, probably totally disagree with, definitely things we don't understand, and if we're honest, things that simply cost us too much. You will come against things you don't like, things you probably totally disagree with, Definitely things you don't understand, and if you're totally honest, you'll come across things that you'll say to yourself, that cost me too much. I'll just, I won't do that one, but I'll take these ones. But I won't do that one. That'll cost me a bit too much. But I'm happy with these over here. I read a story about a man this week. Uh, he appeared before the pearly gates. That should tell you it's not a true story. Anyway, a man appeared before the pearly gates. Have you ever done anything of particular merit, says Peter? He says, well, I can think of one thing, replied the man. Once I came upon a group of high testosterone bikers who were threatening a young woman. I directed them to leave her alone, but they wouldn't listen. So I approached the largest and most heavily tattooed biker. I smacked him in the head, kicked over his bike, ripped out his nose ring and threw it on the ground and told him, you leave her alone now or you'll answer to me. Peter was so impressed. He said, when did this happen? He said, about two minutes ago. Sometimes there's a cost to doing what we know is right. And how many of you know the gray spaces, the gray spaces that Christians have shared with the rest of the world for many years in the West, the gray spaces are disappearing. That place where we like to play in, where we could be best friends here and best friends of the world and best friends, one best buddy, one best buddy, that place, it's disappearing fast. And we need to make a decision, which teachings are we going to hold on to? Because it's hard to hold on to both. You can't do it. Which teachings are you going to hang on to? Three things, just 
to finish up very quick that Jesus said in this passage. Number one, he said that true disciples stay in his teachings. You know, research has shown that only two out of ten Christians, hear me on this, two out of ten Christians in Australia read their Bible each day. Two out of ten. So we got what's, let's say we had 70 people here, what would that be? Rod, what's two out of ten out of seven? Two be what, ten, fourteen? Something like that. You're good at math. Fourteen. So I've got 14 people to stand up in this room and there were 70 people here and we all look around. Statistics, two out of ten people are holding, remaining, staying in the teachings of Jesus. Is it any wonder we're so confused about what he taught? Is it any wonder that somebody comes along with a fancy terminology or a translation of a Greek word plucked out of random and says, oh, but this means that? And we go, oh, well, it must mean that then. And we get blown about by every wind of doctrine. See, we don't know enough about what Jesus teaches because we just don't spend enough time in his word. And for those of us that feel like, yeah, but the early church didn't have the Bible, they just had the Holy Spirit. They did just have the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. But they also had the first-hand account of people that walked with Jesus or no more than, say, one generation away who talked to Peter, talked to John, talked to Matthew. Now, if anyone's ever played Chinese Whispers, you would know that if we continued on like that, we'd be a weird mob right now. Because the message would have been so twisted and so destroyed. That's why God, through his wisdom, made sure that these ancient writers recorded this and that through 2,000 years of human history, even though nations have tried to burn it, destroy it and take it away, we still got these words. We still got them. And some of us have got 14, 15, 20 copies on the shelves at home and it's disappointing if you're one of the people with 20 copies but we don't even read it each week. We barely pick it up. Well, Jesus said, if you're my disciple, you'll abide in my word. You want to become a true disciple of Jesus? I'd stay in, continue in, journey in the word and the teachings of Jesus Christ. We live in a culture today that's even using the very words of God against what the church stands for and what Jesus stood for. I could just say God is love, and that became a big slogan some years back, and I don't want to get into it, but God is love is actually from the Bible, but it was used to teach things that aren't necessarily taught in the Scriptures. And because we don't know any better, we went, oh, that's right, that's in the Bible. God is love, yeah. And we just run with it. Before you know it, society is pushing, pushing, and the church is retreating, retreating, because we just don't know what Jesus taught. Second thing Jesus said here is that his teachings reveal how the world truly works. Teachings actually reveal how the world truly works. If I butt up against something that God said, and I don't like it, and I don't understand it, and I think differently to it, I've made the decision, I've just got to surrender myself to the fact that, well, God knows better. God knows better than I do. Thirdly, Jesus said that it was his teachings that bring true freedom. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. And if you do that and you abide in my word, here's what's going to happen. You're going to know truth. You're going to butt up against truth. Truth's going to rub up against you. And as that truth rubs up against you, you begin to apply that truth. You're going to find freedom comes into your world. Now, that picture up there. I'll explain what it is. I'm going to take you back to the 17th century when world travel and world business involved using large sailing ships. These ships would sail virtually all over the world. Many of them sailed from places like Great Britain. It's estimated that over one million people travelled across the Atlantic Ocean in that century. Over one million people left their loved ones behind as they faced the great adventure of travelling to the Americas. They all waved goodbye and promised to return. Unfortunately, over 700,000 of them perished at sea. Your first thought may be that these 700,000 died in the fierce storms on the high seas. No, they perished due to scurvy. Scurvy is a deficiency of vitamin C. Now, there was plenty of food on board, and there was always plenty of fish to eat, but there was no way of getting vitamin C. So dying from scurvy, it's not a very pleasant experience, But there was one man by the name of Captain Cook that solved the problem. Sauerkraut. It contains cabbage loaded with vitamin C and could easily be preserved within within large drums of salt solution. It would last forever. It never went bad. It was always fresh. But the only problem was that the English people hated the taste of sauerkraut. They refused to eat sauerkraut. No matter what the captain of the ship told them, they refused and perished. Over 700,000 people died at sea all because they refused to eat sauerkraut. 
And I want to leave you with this thought. How many people's faith dies because we just refuse to eat sauerkraut? I'm too busy. So am I. I haven't got time. Neither do I. Don't understand. Neither do I. <laughs> Refuse to eat sauerkraut. Father, I just pray for each of us in this place this morning, Lord. God, we, we, we don't want to... God, we don't want to just be a community of people who... come to you with great expectation that you would give us all the things that we want because that's what God does. Father, we want to be a community that is transformed in heart and mind and life. God, we don't want to be a community that goes from faith to faith to faith just to get a need met. Lord, we want to be a community that wakes up every morning it says, Lord, I'm going to need faith today just to make the right decisions. I'm going to need faith today just to stand my ground in a culture that's very anti the Judeo-Christian worldview. I'm going to need faith today to treat people the way that you want me to treat them because they're not going to help. I'm going to need faith today to manage my affairs in a way that's befitting somebody that calls on the name of Jesus. So, Father, I just pray for each person in this room. Lord, would you speak to us? God, even as we leave this place today, we wouldn't just forget uh, what we've heard and move on and have our lunch and so on. But, God, let your word rest in us. God, let that seed that was planted today, water it, fertilise it, breathe life into it, Lord, and turn us into the people that you want us to be, God. Turn us into the people that you envisioned would represent you in Lismore in 2022 when you birthed this thing called the church. And Lord, I also pray in the next seven days as we go from this place, Father, there's lots of people out there that don't uh, know about you, they don't understand, they haven't heard about the goodness of God, they haven't heard about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, they haven't heard uh, about a God that has a plan, a purpose that loves them. So Father, in the next seven days, would you give each person in this room the opportunity to tell somebody else about you? God, somebody that up to this point doesn't know who you are and what you've done for them. God, give us the chance to speak to them in the next seven days, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys.